I'm Vanya Erickson, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Vanya Erickson. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I am your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the subscribe links over in the right-hand sidebar. You can subscribe on your Android phone, your iPhone, it's Stitcher Radio, anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can find Author Stories. We're also on YouTube. There's a link over in the right ha- right-hand sidebar as well. And you can subscribe there and never miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by the AIPP, the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. If you are an indie author and you need to build a support team to help you uh, format your book, edit your book, get a cover designed for your book, the anything that an indie author needs to get their book out there, the AIPP has a member that can help you make your book your product the very best it can be. If you look in the uh, show notes at the bottom of this episode, you'll find a link to the AIPP or go to aippconline.org slash members and browse through the member library and find the professional to fill out your team. Like I said, anything that you need to make your indie publishing journey a success, there's a member there to help. It's a very simple website, very easy to navigate through. Go check out AIPPonline.org slash members today and fill out your indie author team. At the end of the show, be sure to stick around for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Essence, Book One, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Troy is no longer himself. Kidnapped by aliens, infected with the essence of the dead General Tomas, Troy grasps at his only hope of survival. He merges his soul with the alien parasite trying to possess him, leaving him forever changed, and not entirely for the worse. Once plagued by crippling phobias, Troy is now fearless, willing to fight his enemies with his bare hands. But with his new strength also comes a new weakness, women. Tomas was notorious for his insatiable desires, and Troy finds himself constantly resisting temptation, especially the gorgeous, manipulative Alta. Although Alta has convinced the Pyrrhans she's helping them prepare to battle the murderous Reptarans, she's actually meticulously planning to steal their ultimate power source and then abandon them to their fate. Alta won't hesitate to kill anyone in her way, and her deep love for Tomas is Troy's only advantage. He convinces Alta that Tomas has taken full control of his being and thus keeps her trust and his life. While Alta schemes, Troy covertly struggles to save the Pyrrhans and prevent the Reptorans from invading Earth. But first, he must wrest back control of his own soul. Essence, Book One, Septima, the first volume in the exciting new science fiction series by Nick Breaker. Find it on Amazon today. There's a link in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Vanya Erickson on the show with me. Vanya has a fascinating new book called Boot Language, and it is out now. Uh, Today is release day for this fantastic book. It's a memoir, and uh, here on the show, we love memoir. We love uh, when writers really dig deep and uh, and tell us their stories. So uh, thank you for uh, joining me today, Vanya. Oh, you're very welcome. It's great to be here. Well, uh, it's great to have you. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I was about four years old, and I was listening to my grandmother uh, storytell basically and thought 
I wonder if I could ever do this. Um, it was just so captivating. Now, um, was your, your grandmother, was this like a, a family gathering? Was she just speaking with you? Uh, what was the context of, of her storytelling? It was in her living room and she was in her rocker and um, she would recount stories and poems in a sort of an Irish brogue, if you will. Um, that's her heritage, um, although she was, was not normally speaking this way. She sounded like a Midwesterner, um, but she just thrilled me with the ability to <clears throat> take on characters' voices and um, very shortly thereafter, discovered my mother was doing the same thing all the time. So uh, it was just I'm, I was pretty much surrounded by it. Wow, that that's fascinating. Um, uh, you know, that's a that's a very southern thing to um, uh, to sit sit and tell stories and uh, to kind of relay our heritage. That's a I don't hear that. I hear that a lot from people that grew up in the South. I don't hear that so much from people that grew up in other regions, and uh, which is very fascinating to me. Oh, well, that's it's, you know, I think in some families um, you have particular people who want to share information and others who are really quiet about what went on in their life. Um, or maybe they don't, they were never told the information, but I was just, always drawn to the storytellers and my grandparents were both great ones. And, um, so it was, I got a lot, I got a lot of information and, 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 and in the sharing of, of things that weren't family related, such as poetry, um, always recant, reciting, um, uh, poems for us. Um, when I was a laddie long time in the shul, my father, and it, she would just go on and on. And half the time, honestly, I didn't know what she was talking about. Um, <laughs> but I was so thrilled with being transported. I just could see it. I could make it up in my mind what she was talking about. And then, of course, you know, this went on for years and years and years, and I eventually knew all the stories by heart. So, um, what, Was this something that, that her parents did for her? Do you, do you have any idea? I don't have any idea. I know my, my father ran away, I mean, my, pardon me, my grandfather ran away from home when he was 11. And um, he found comfort in stories when he, he became a cowpoke. Um, and he worked for a ranch and they would sit around and the men would tell stories. Um, and so he just carried that through to when he had children and grandchildren. But my grandmother, I... I don't recall. I know she had a rather tragic um, upbringing, and um, I think this just brought her peace. I think that's kind of a general theme in the family is stories bring peace. Sure, sure. Um, I, I used to ask the question, uh, what's your first memory of wanting to be a writer? And uh, my friend Craig Johnson, who writes the Longmire Mysteries, uh, kind of educated me on the the oral storytelling tradition of uh, especially cowboys and and uh, riding you know fences or, or, or riding herd and uh, and and that's when I, I kind of started to realize that 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 uh, that storytellers are are a breed of their own and and whether you go into write or not is is really not the point it's the the gift you either have the storytelling gift or you don't and uh, so that's why I ask about storytelling or writing uh and i i love to to hear that this is something that's gone on in your family and was was handed down to you that's uh that's fascinating yeah thanks yeah it's important yeah uh, so so what part of the country uh were you raised in um in the rural part of northern california in the sierra nevada um and so i was surrounded by uh a lot of that my influences were were storytellers, the, the, the man who managed the, the cattle in our absence, um, very strong, fond memories of him on a cattle drive, or we'd be uh, just camping out in some remote location, and he'd tell us stories about what used to happen when he was a boy uh, on a ranch, and it just drove me. It, it was everything I wanted to do, was to write about this 
the, these experiences, these very special people, um, and and bring them to life, and ha- and have other people recognize the beauty of those stories. Uh, that part of California is, is not one that we that we think about very often. I, I think uh, even though California is such a massive state uh, geographically, uh, and well, and 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 very diverse in the types of people and uh, the the types of, of topography, and the, the whole region is just very diverse. Um, is is this part of California uh, overlooked uh, in your opinion? Well, thankfully, it's a little bit overlooked. <laughs> it's sort of like, but now I don't live there. And when I go back, because I make a, you know, a return to Mecca, maybe one or two times a year, just to stand and smell what I used to smell, and to see the beauty of the mountains. Um, I'm really grateful. It's not tremendously popular. Um, it, it is, of course, you have a lot of um, boomers that are moving up there because land is cheaper. Um, but, uh, in general, there's this sense that it's almost like it was back in the day. Um, and that's kind of special in California in particular, since, you know, we take in a lot, a lot of people every year and, um, and so it's just, it, it hasn't, hasn't changed. Let me put it that way as much. You still have a feeling that you're in rural California. And the way you talk about it, uh, it, it, uh, it I, you can definitely tell that, that you go back to, to remember those things because, uh, you know, sadly, the, the farther we get from a place and time, those memories become, uh, muddy and, uh, it's hard to, to pull out the particulars. Um, so it, it definitely shows that, that you have stayed connected, uh, with that. Yes, most definitely. It's, it's such a big part of my life. Um, <clears throat> when I was growing up, we had two homes. And my parents were married and together, but we had two homes. And one was the cattle ranch in the Sierra Nevada, and the other one was um, a lovely home tucked against the hills in um, what, what is now called the Silicon Valley. It's right at the base of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, uh, and so, it, and that would be, uh, more central California, um, south of San Francisco, beautiful weather, um, beautiful scenery. Um, it was just very different. My mother being a city person, we needed to be near the opera and theater and places where she could perform. And my father being the cowboy, um, we had the cattle ranch. So we would just uh, constantly transported from one place to the other, back and forth. Weekends during school, all of the summer, all of the vacations, and then we'd be back in the Silicon Valley for for the school year. Nice. Um, you, you talked about this uh, storytelling tradition passed on by your, uh, your grandmother and your grandfather, and then you, you found out that your mother uh, did that as well. Uh, at what point did you realize that this was going to be uh, part of your vocation and that writing was going to be so uh, integral to who you are? I, I think when I started to perform skits, um, I would I would create uh, a script and I'd perform it in honor of a lot of different things. And I would probably maybe seven years old, something like that, when this started, when, pe- when guests would arrive, I'd have a, <laughs> an honorary poem to recite and perform. I was a dancer, so I would, I'm sure it was hysterical. As a mother, they, they didn't laugh. Um, they, <laughs> they just enjoyed the, the performance. But um, the guest of honor was always um, rather taken aback. And um, I would just, I would say how meaningful this is to have you here. And, and it, but it would be in a, from a seven years seven-year-old's point of view, um, or a reflection on a family trip. I would um, create a, something, some skit to um, honor that. And I, it was just something that seemed important to me, and I've, of course, all, forever had a diary. Um, uh, yeah, but but I think that that's, 
that's really it. It's been a, a, a gosh, forever, um, uh, just sort of like taking on books about writing. And of course, my first love is writing for children. Um, and I uh, just a, completely fascinated with children's literature, have a rather huge library. Of course, I taught third grade for a couple of decades, so that helps too. But, um, but I think that, but for me personally, for writing, um, before I got to the place where I felt I was comfortable writing for children, I needed to get some stories out uh, from my past. And that was what my mentor, Laura Davis, um, said to me one day when I said, I can't, I can't, I just for whatever reason, I'm, I'm having a tough time getting to a story for children. All that keeps coming up is my past. And she said, then go with that. You have, you have to start there. And, and then, of course, the outcome is boot language. Uh, you've been teaching uh, writing uh, for a while, haven't you? Yes. Yes. I, I taught third grade writing. Well, I, actually other grades as well, but specifically um, in the educational system, um, taught writing and performance, uh, performing arts, basically, um, for a couple of decades. And currently, when I retired, there were a lot of people, there was this big clamor of what the heck, why are you leaving? And I explained that I want to De devote full time to writing. And I took on about eight students who want to publish um, or they um, feel they need to have a deeper understanding of how to write. And so they're completely fascinated by this process. And of course, it's super helpful having your teacher be an author. And uh, they're very, with lack of a better word, inspired to to get out there. Um, and, and you have been writing, uh, uh, all along through that journey of teaching and exploring your own stories. Um, but now we, we come to the new book, Boot Language. And I find it fascinating that all of the, uh, the descriptions you've given us so far of your, uh, your, your home life, your family, all of that have been, uh, have been wonderful memories, uh, from, from what you've described to us so far and things that, uh, that any of us would look back and say, wow, Vanya had a, had a, a really great childhood. And, um, <laughs> and, and as is so often, um, you know, with the, with the sweet comes melancholy and, uh, with the, with the idyllic comes the things in the shadows. Um, first off, um, why did you want to write this book and why was now, uh, the time to write this book. And then maybe we'll talk a little about some of the specifics after that. Sure. Um, this was something I was completely, com I, the, la <laughs> the best way to describe it is I was called to do this. I, I couldn't write about anything else. And um, it, specific scenes of my childhood came up over and over again. And I found that when I would write them, I, there was some healing and um, relief at having <clears throat> told them to other people, have other people listen to them. Um, and then, then I have a group of people that I work with uh, writing wise, a nice feedback group. And they kept saying, we want more. We want what else? What about this? And, you know, and so I just kept writing stories. And then at some point in that period of five years of writing those stories down, I realized I just wanted to put it together and into a lovely, cohesive book. And that's what I did. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. What's so strange is, um, you know, as a writing teacher and, and someone that, that's been in the writing world for a while, uh, I'm sure you've had a conversation uh, that goes something like, 
um, you know, when someone is, is digging deep and, and telling stories from their life, um, I, I know I've done this, uh, you look at them and say, wow, man, you know, when, when you tell your own story, there's such power in that. And, and when you really dig deep down and, and you dig out those things and you share them with other people, the power of story can, can absolutely change lives as, as cliche as that may sound. Um, and it's so easy to tell that to other people and to hear other people's stories and say, oh, wow, that's really powerful. That's, that's really going to affect someone deeply. Um, it's an entirely different thing when it's your own story to tell isn't it it's a (laughs) yes um it's a oh my gosh am i saying this right am i am i actually going to let people know that this happened it was um was really that 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 was the turning point is making that decision um when an editor said to me there's more isn't there and i you know, there's always God. more, <laughs> there's always more. And so I just, I just dumped it all onto the keyboard and, um, and it, I'm grateful that, that she pushed me because I was super resistant. Um, and, but it, but it, what a transformation it, it made the story deeper, more compelling. Um, there was a, a I, I believe in, in, the point of this is that even though someone has had a uh, fairly dramatic background um, uh, where a lot of, I guess you might say, negative things have happened, I am who I am today because of them. And, and so, I, and so I, I, res- I respect that. I, I hold that to myself. I don't want another life. I, I'm sure I felt that way as a t- teenager that I wanted another life. I know I did. I think most teens do. Um, but now at 64, I'm grateful. And, and, and that's, that's what it is. And even, even to the people who harmed me, I'm grateful for the experience of living through it, growing from it. And also understanding the damage that they had in their past. Yeah. Well, here's the problem when when you're dealing with with stuff like that is uh, every teenager would would probably wish to have a different life. And it's uh, it's an entirely different thing to want a different situation when you're in the middle of it, when you're in the midst of it. I think every one of us would choose to not suffer. Uh, but on the other side of that, hindsight is a beautiful thing in that we can see uh, the the jagged path that that we traveled and the places that it has taken us, um, and 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 maybe that that's you know the benefit of of hindsight is that we can we can see that the things that we couldn't change at the time have made us who we are. Yes, absolutely. I think that you that's very wise what you just said there. Um, you know, as fiction writers, and, and a lot of the guests that we have are, are fiction writers, and uh, a lot of who we are as writers wind up in the story. And uh, not to say that that every character that a that a writer writes is them; it's absolutely not. But there are pieces of us that get into there just because we're writing from our experiences and uh, you know things that we think or feel, or maybe things we've always wanted to say but can't. You know, those things come out in your writing. Uh, but when you're writing memoir, this oh, gosh. this is you. It, there's no there's no hiding it. There's no cloaking it. There, there's no dressing it up in in something else and being coy and and knowing that the reader will never be able to decipher what's really you and what's you just being, uh, you know, Miss Writer. Uh, what does when you're when you're sitting down to write your stories, um, how do how do you choose where to start? For one, Be, because memoir is is kind of a a window to your life, whereas a, a biography might be a, a start to finish. Uh, a memoir is usually kind of a window into a, a situation or a time. Uh, how do you choose where to start and how to couch the story? Ah, well, um, that's a great, fabulous question. Um, I, I would I would say that there's always the initial outpouring of words when you when when a memory hits and you oh okay I'm going to write about that 
and you get going, there's all sorts of stuff that gets onto the page that is not what you end up with. It's emotion. It's, you know, there, you know, in the worst cases, there's this victim voice that comes out and, and then you get through it and then you realize, no, this isn't how I want to portray this. This isn't really how it happened. That's, that sounds like a very emotional response to um, the situation. And I get to do the thing that I love the most. Um, I must admit, people think I'm odd, but I love editing. I just, uh, it's my favorite part of writing. Um, I will take, uh, just time goes by. It's like the, one of those beautiful things. I know you know about this, where you sit down. time and you go what happened to the day i uh, that is that is my experience of working um rearranging words um to create create as much of a perfection as i can um about getting as close as i can to the emotional truth about what happened in that scene so these are always i'm a pantser i i admit it i have always written by the seat of my pants grabbing whatever nugget it is that is the hottest for me right there. And so then I just do that and um, later shape them into a book. Right. Right. I, I think a lot of people are like that. Um, there are, uh, you know, there are people that are pure pantsers and pure plotters. And, and I think most of us are kind of in the middle somewhere. We know where we're going, but we're, we're kind of, joy riding by the seat of our pants between those things that we know. Um, when you, when you decided to write this book, uh, was it a, a yeah. Oh, hello, Fanya. Are you there? Uh, are you there? Oh, I, I lost sorry? you for a second. I'm sorry. Okay. You cut out a little while ago, but I think we're, oh, are we okay now? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're fine. We're fine. Okay. Um, I, I'll just edit that part out. No, no one will, will be any wiser. Okay. Um, when you are, uh, when you start to write a book like this, and, and I know you said that the things just pour out and, uh, and then you go back and shape it later, but do you start looking for uh, a common thread maybe in the editing of, okay, this is what the story is going to be about. And, and this is, uh, you know, the, the kind of overarching narrative that this book is going to cover. Uh, how do you decide kind of what the theme of this book is? Even, even though it's you, um, th there's a theme to it. How, how do you settle in on that? Well, I think with the overriding um, feeling I had as I was writing it is, how is it that I am who I am? And what is it that pulled me through? What is the thread that carried all the way through um, my life to now? And I have to say, it's it's beauty and finding finding things that are elevated whether it's music or the mountains the sunset um in any given situation finding something to i think i probably as a child began to do that just to divert my attention from the negative but then it became just automatic i would find something lovely in a scene that was not and so I think, I don't know if that's answering the question, but that's, that's where I went with it is finding the theme. And then of course, you know, finding thematic, uh, threads through it. And I realized, I recognized that leather is throughout the entire. Um, I was noting was coming up, they were coming up over and over again, the color red. Um, there would be a variety of things, um, silence, uh, in other words, my silence, um, or my mother's silence, uh, in given situations. Uh, and so there were things that I carried that thread and tried to use once I recognized that those were critical to the story. Um, uh, they were, they were placed uh, is the best way to put it, um, uh, inserted into stories um, where it made the most sense. So I would include uh, some reference to leather 
um, or I would describe something um, using the word red. Um, and so there was this carrying through, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. um, you've got these, uh, these descriptors, uh, this very visual way that you talk about the, the, the ranches and the ranch and the horses and the mountains and the idyllic uh, rural lifestyle. But that is contrasted with uh, with loving yet broken people uh, around you, and uh, it, when you start, and, and you said that that uh, situations in your life where you would find the good in something, uh, even in a bad situation, you would find something beautiful and something good in it. Um, as you're writing this, and you're forced to go beyond the good and the beautiful and get to the broken. Uh, what was that writing process like for you? And were you, uh, kind of forced to, uh, to bring some truth, uh, to maybe things that had been covered over and maybe glossed over and, and maybe glossed over by you for your own benefit to, to just get through. But when you start peeling that back, what is that like emotionally? Well, um, <laughs> it's devastating, um, to, recognize that uh, your father is so damaged and yet he never speaks about it. And, and so you have no idea why he's not connecting, why he doesn't love you, why he doesn't be any of those. Uh, father might be like, um, it is overwhelming as an older person to recognize what he went through in World War II and what he saw and his experiences. And no wonder he never spoke of it. Um, I'm the one who found out that he was at Pearl Harbor. Um, I had the naval records. I discovered he was in the ship that was way far away. Well, not way far away, but far away from the initial bombing. And you know, he was 23. I mean, goodness gracious. I think of myself as 23 in a no way. Oh, I was an uh, idiot at 23. I, that's exactly, <laughs> I'm thinking about my, my kids at 23. It's like, there's no, there's anyway, it's yeah. a, it was a different world. I, I recognize that. And, and yet he was too young. Um, in my mind, he was very much a baby, you know, recognizing and never being able to rise above it. He just couldn't. Um, as a lot of people do, if they're damaged, they self-medicate with alcohol. And um, I try not, and I don't believe I do, use the word alcoholic in my story at all. Um, but there you have it. That's what it was, an abusive alcoholic who raises a child and and everything that goes with that and it's it makes it it's <laughs> there are times when I'm writing about it that I I can't breathe I'm crying so hard because I I wish that back in the day someone could have lent it lent, lent a hand and helped these guys who came back and I, there was nothing like that you just you just were the war was over and you got a job um, you just didn't talk about it. And it's just very hard knowing what we know now about PTSD and the ramifications of not seeking help. It's, it's really hard knowing your dad was suffering so, so horribly. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's eye opening yet difficult, uh, and painful to start coming to grips with, um, with the fact that that people that harmed you uh, were were also harmed and were uh, were not well people, uh, because then that puts a human face to it when it's so easy to just harbor bitterness and just to think of someone as purely evil. And I'm I'm not saying that you thought of your father as purely evil, but uh, we, we all we have all experienced someone in our in our lives that that's been that way, and it would be just so easy 
to just write them off instead of putting a human face on them and, and putting a name to their suffering. Uh, that, that is a, an entire lesson on, on, on grace and forgiveness there that, uh, you know, that, that, that we could go deep on. But, uh, it, it, it really is transformational when that happens, isn't it? Oh, yes. Well, you know, I love my parents and I've had, I've had editors who say, you gotta be kidding. Um, you really have to be kidding. Nobody's going to believe you. I think people will. And so, you know, years later, here I am saying, I love my parents. And I know that, that they did at their time, I believe, as well as they, they did the best they could. They were both terrifically damaged. And, and that's what happens when <laughs> damaged people have kids. They are living their life and they, they can't be anybody else. Right, right. Um, I, I don't want to give away too much of the book and, and getting into uh, all of the the storylines there, if you will. And I know that uh, there was a lot with your mother and her uh, religious beliefs and how those um, were interpreted, uh, you know, with, with you and your family. Um, but uh, on the other side of that, as you were an adult and your parents have, have gone on, and you are left to then raise a family of your own and then to uh, uh, to uh, form a relationship with with the, the man that would be the uh, the father of your children and grandchildren and to see that everyone is not like your experience. And, and maybe he has his own experiences that uh, that you can shed light on. But when uh, when you start coming to grips with it for yourself, how do we break that cycle? Um, because like so many things that are handed down from parents and grandparents, uh, these, uh, these, this damage can be handed down as well. And until one of us pops our head up above it all and, and says, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like this. So how do we break that cycle? That's a great question. Um, I, I believe that there are many, many ways in which society says you can break the cycle through therapy, um, through, you know, medication. I believe um, that a better application might be, I'm not saying therapy's bad. I've been through a lot of it. Um, but I do believe that understanding that what happened is, the, the events that happened is not going to miraculously disappear from your memory. It is... It is. It is what it is. It is part of you and to accept it and to embrace it. And I think that when I came to the, I, first of all, let me just say, I spent many years avoiding relationship because I was so terrified of having a similar situation. Um, and so when I eventually did marry and have children, it was a very conscious effort to not be my parents. They were in my head all the time in, in, in that the voice of your parents, you know, it, it sits there and it'll say something like, um, boy, I'm really ticked off right now. You should be shouting or, um, Oh dear. Um, it's all right. Everything's lovely. Um, nothing, you know, so those are my two parents, they're polar opposites. And so, I, I came to the decision that I was not go I was going to break the cycle and I was not going to do this, that, um, alcohol wasn't a part of my life. Um, and, and that, that I was not going to, um, do anything that would be, um, reminding myself of that. And yet when we say that, uh, when my children would be naughty or whatever, I'd raise my voice and I'd, I'd hear dad. And I just back off and handle it much more subtly and respectfully. And it was just a, a it, it was it was a very interesting scene inside my head of what I wanted to say because it was such an automatic response is what I'd heard all the way through my childhood and what I chose to say. And it was a Herculean effort to do that. My daughters thank me now. <laughs> but but it was something else to, to do that. 
Uh, Vanya, you have a fascinating story, uh, and uh, the book Boot Language is is a beautiful look into that. Um, everyone, it's on sale uh, everywhere now. There's a uh, there's a link to it in the show notes, and uh, we're going to send everybody to pick up a copy of Boot Language. Uh, Vanya, if people are not familiar with you and your work and want to get connected with you, where can they find you online? You can find me at vanyaerickson.com. And um, I'm on Facebook at uh, Vanya Erickson author um, page, and uh, those are the best ways to reach me. Awesome. Uh, we will put links to it in the show notes. Uh, Vanya, we wish you much success on the book launch, and uh, thank you for taking time to come on the show today. Thanks so much. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. Jason yanked the coils of safety rope to one shoulder and heaved them out the attic window. The bundle bounced over the roof line and dropped to the yard below. He tightened the harness, making sure the shoulder straps were snug over his sweatshirt. He threaded his rope through the braking device tested it, and clipped everything to the carabiner at his navel. So far, so good. Fireman Mike would be proud. His stomach flipped as he neared the octagonal window. Had he tied the correct knots? Would he get himself killed? Weeks had passed since Mike's tutorial and... But he had to attempt the break-in now, while both Van Brunts were at the Christmas Eve service. He swung his legs through the window and felt for the roof. His sneakers gripped the shingles and he wriggled out, grateful for once to have feet as big as snowshoes. He pulled on a ski mask and sang, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. He lowered his body. Wind punched him in the jaw like a supervillain, surprising him. His sweatshirt rode up and snow burrowed into his navel. He looked down but couldn't see his feet. He relaxed his hands and put a few ounces of weight on the rope. Clots of snow broke away, dove over the edge, and took far too long to hit ground. He drew his rope around the pipe and pulled tight. Now he could drop. No, you will not drop. You will repel. You will repel very safely. He backed towards the edge, towards the point of no return. The backyard lurched into view. It was a four-story fall, and he'd probably hit the stairs on the way down. He sledded helplessly. His legs fell, swung, and kicked the side of the house. Alarm bells went off in his head. He gripped the rope. It looked like nothing. A shoelace. Jason Crane, you're a damn fool. He went limp and fell over. The rope gave a jolt, and the harness tried to castrate him. He twisted, trying to save his poor descendants. He began to spin. His arm bashed through a row of icicles. The spin slowed, reversed, and at last he came to a stop with his back to the house, dangling over the backyard. Thank you, rope. That's a good rope. Well done. He tried to turn around, but couldn't. With patience, he worked out a method of kicking in circles and managed to press his sneakers to the side of the house. He needed slack. He gathered his loose rope to the small of his back and disengaged the brake. Zip! He fell fast, all his weight on the rope now. His feet, planted, shot up over his head. The brake caught him, and the rope vibrated as wildly as a guitar string striking a note of panic. Jason heard a crunching sound and looked up. The leaf gutter crumpled and poured a stream of bitter ice water into his eyes. He snarled and wiped his face, dripping humiliation. Jason rested a moment and stared at his reflection in the glass. He was an enormous Macy's balloon drifting over New Jersey, tethered at the navel like underdog. How the hell did you get up here, kid? He did an awkward split, one foot above the window and the other below, hanging sideways with his weight on one hip. He closed his eyes and reached for the sill, crouching against the side of the house. His fingernails found the weather stripping, and he tugged. Locked. He cursed and tugged again, anger rising. He grabbed the frame with both hands and pulled with all his spider strength. Something popped. The window rose and the curtains splashed out. 
Jason dove headfirst into the fabric, wriggled and kicked, let out some rope and fell with a whump into his archenemy's lair. <laughs>